Welcome to the DDS Map Technical Assistance Tool Overview Webinar. I'm Carolyn Whittemore, a DDS Map Coordinator, and I'm your webinar presenter for the first half of today's presentation, and my counterpart, Heather Lake, will be presenting the second half. The target audience for this overview includes, but is not limited to, registered nurses who are MAP trainers or whose job duties include oversight of med systems, licensed practical nurses who may assist an RN or be assigned to a program, and especially MAP certified supervisors. Ultimately, the residential supervisor is responsible for maintaining a program's medication system. The purpose of a medication system is twofold, to protect the individuals and staff by ensuring safe medication administration. The DDS MAP Technical Assistance Tool has been revised to more completely reflect what we expect to see when conducting a Tech Assist visit. I have two goals for today's webinar. To give you a general overview of MAP expectations in a residential setting, and secondly, for you to know where to access MAP resources. The Tech Tool has been included as an attachment with today's webinar, and the most current revision is now dated 31518. Map resources available to you can be accessed online using the map friendly URL on your screen. When going to a program, I use the Tech Assist tool to evaluate the medication system. To locate the tool, go to the map friendly URL, click on Oversight and Review. And if you printed out a copy to follow along, you might want to grab it and a pen in case you want to take down any notes. Modifications were made to the tool to expand upon what we currently ask for. So let's get started. As I move through the slides, the bottom right corner has a corresponding map policy reference. In regard to healthcare provider order forms, there is no required MAP HCP order form you must use. However, there are order form requirements. The MAP policy section 13 provides guidance of required HCP order components such as the five rights, allergies, signatures, dates, etc. So to be considered valid, HCP orders must be signed and dated by the HCP. All once daily medication orders must be further clarified to the portion of the day the med is to be given. If there are more than one page of orders, then each page must be signed and dated. Electronic signatures are accepted. And the HCP orders the dose of the medication, including if the medication is a liquid med. So for example, when I'm conducting a review, if I see an HCP order for milk of magnesia, I expect the dose to be written in milligrams and not mLs, so such as 2400 milligrams and not 30 mLs. And in the event of prior authorization by the insurance company before you're able to obtain the med, you must contact the HCP and obtain a recommendation about what you should do until the med is obtained. If you do not, the omitted doses are considered medication occurrences. A PRN medication order means the medication will only be given for specific target signs and symptoms which must be included in the HCP order. If there are scheduled doses of the same medication, then the PRN medication order must include a parameter of how closely the doses may be given to each other. Reasons such as pain, constipation, or anxiety must be clearly defined with objective criteria for use. An example of objective criteria for constipation could be defined as three days without a bowel movement, and objective criteria for anxiety could be defined as pacing and rocking back and forth for five consecutive minutes. PRN orders may not contain ranges in amount of medication to give or frequency in giving the medication. All HCP orders must be posted and verified. This includes HCP medication orders and orders that do not include medication, such as labs or a special instruction. 
At times, the HCP may not write any new orders. However, the HCP order still needs to be posted and verified, indicating that staff are aware no new orders were written. Posting and verifying does not take place on a medication sheet, nor is it documented within the body of the HCP order. Posting and verifying takes place on the HCP order form below the doctor's signature. Telephone orders are unique in that they must be posted and verified twice, once as soon as the med is received into the home and transcribed, and then again after it's been signed by the HCP. The purpose of posting and verifying a second time is to check whether the HCP made changes to the order when signing it. A protocol is considered an extension of the HCP order. Anytime there is a protocol which gives details regarding medication administration, the protocol must be signed and dated by the HCP, and all protocols must be posted and verified. A prescription may not be used in place of an HCP order. A prescription is communication between the HCP and the pharmacist. The HCP order is communication between the HCP and the staff regarding medication administration. Anytime there's a discharge from the hospital, the orders in place prior to the admission are no longer valid. New orders must be obtained at the time of discharge. Medication orders in place prior to the admission are DC'd on the med sheets and the new orders are transcribed, which means you must contact the PCP and any other prescribing HCP to ask if they want any previously ordered medications reordered. If the answer is yes, those orders must be rewritten. A statement such as resume all meds as previously ordered is not a complete order and therefore is unacceptable. The Medication Reconciliation Discharge Checklist was created as a tech assist to help you in the event of a hospital discharge. You can find additional detailed information regarding hospital discharge orders using the Map Friendly URL and clicking on the Map Education Tools for Supervisors link. Module 4 is all about discharge orders. In addition, the MAP Curriculum, Responsibilities in Action, has information regarding hospital discharge orders in Unit 4. If an HCP order form contains multiple medication orders and then one of the orders is DC'd or is superseded by a new order, then staff should indicate the change by marking in the margin of the HCP order near the specific medication, DC, the date, and their initials. If the HCP makes a change to an existing medication order, the current supply of medication on hand may be used as long as the new HCP order reflects the change. The medication strength on hand allows for easy administration, the container is flagged using a sticker that does not cover any of the label directions, and the old order must be DC'd on the med sheet and the new order transcribed. Changes cannot be made to an existing transcription to reflect the new order. The HCP orders, pharmacy labels, and medication sheets must all agree. The medication name, as it appears on the HCP order, must be printed on the pharmacy label and the medication sheet, letter for letter. I will also ask you what internal system is in place to monitor that meds are being given as prescribed. A MAP monitoring system will help to ensure that the program is being managed to meet all regulatory requirements. The next section is Section B, Over-the-Counter Method B. Some agencies do not utilize over-the-counter method B, meaning all over-the-counter medications and dietary supplements are labeled by the pharmacist. However, if your agency does utilize over-the-counter method B, you'll want to be sure that all requirements on this topic are met. Over-the-counter meds not labeled by a pharmacist 
must be verified by a licensed professional, typically the nurse, ensuring that the product purchased is what the HCP ordered. Documentation of the verification is completed by the nurse, writing the individual's name directly on the unopened container of medication in addition to the date and his or her initials. Then, the HCP order must be noted by the nurse that the verification was completed. This process must com be completed each time the order is renewed or rewritten and or each time a new container of the medication is purchased. In addition, staff must be trained in over-the-counter method B as they will be using a manufacturer's label and not a pharmacy label to complete the three checks of the five rights. The training is product specific, meaning if the person is ordered vitamin D3 and also shark's cartilage, a training must be completed for each over-the-counter product. Documentation of the training as seen on your screen must be maintained on site. Section C, Vital Signs. There's a requirement to consult with the HCP to determine whether or not vital signs are needed in relation to med administration. To meet this requirement, order forms typically include a statement such as, if vital signs are required, please include the parameters. Parameters are written guidelines so that staff know what to do if the vital signs they take are not within the parameter as ordered. This is an example of the requirement to document the vital signs taken, in this case a pulse, on a med sheet near the corresponding medication. You can see in the special instruction section the parameters ordered, what to do if the pulse is outside of the parameter, and when to notify the HCP. When the vital sign is outside of the ordered parameters, staff must write a corresponding med progress note explaining the issue and who is notified. So if you take a look at this medication progress note, you can see how staff documented what happened, that the HCP was notified, and then what they're expected to do next. Also notice that staff wrote through all of the boxes and columns. Staff should use as many lines as needed to write a thorough note. A nurse, HCP, pharmacist, paramedic, or EMT can provide the vital signs training. Supporting documentation for this or any training at a minimum must include the training content, the date, name and contact information of the trainer, and a list of staff attending. The instructions for use for each piece of equipment staff have been taught to use must be on site. This means if the electronic BP cuff staff have been taught to use brakes and a new make and model of BP cuff is purchased, a retraining must take place to teach the staff how to use the new piece of equipment. Training documentation must be kept in your program. Most supervisors use a three ring binder to keep the training materials organized. Section D, medication documentation. The HCP order must be correctly transcribed onto the med sheet. If an edit or transcription is required to the transcription on the med sheet, the entire transcription must be crossed out and rewritten. When conducting a review, I always look to see that if a new order is written, that staff are not using the outdated HCP order. Only HCP orders, new and or DC'd, that pertain to the current month's med sheet should be in the HCP order section. If there's a hospital discharge, all HCP orders in place prior to the discharge are no longer valid. The same is true for the transcribed medications. All transcriptions prior to the discharge may not be used. All new hospital discharge orders must be newly transcribed onto the med sheets. Documentation on a med sheet must also include the reason the med is ordered. The reason may come from an existing HCP order, or it may come from the historical record or old HCP orders. The medication sheets must be clear, easy to read, and organized to help decrease the chance of a medication occurrence. And since these are legal documents, documentation should be completed in blue or black ink. 
when you're reviewing the medication documentation, if you notice a blank space where there should be a set of initials, it's important for you to determine if this is a documentation issue, meaning staff gave the med but forgot to document the administration, or if the med was omitted. If the med was given and not initialed at the time, as determined by either asking the staff or through reviewing blister pack monitoring, staff should not go back and initial the blank spaces given, but instead should write a progress note explaining the blank space. This is called a medication issue, not a medication occurrence. Ideally, you want to encourage all staff initialing a med sheet who notice a blank space where there should be initials to contact you. If it is determined that the med was not given, this is a medication occurrence and a MAP consultant must be notified immediately. If a med is refused, I expect to see circled initials on the front of the med sheet a corresponding progress note indicating what med was refused and that the HCP was notified what the HCP recommendation was, if anything, and that a supervisor was also notified. On your screen is a documentation example of a refused medication with the corresponding progress note. Additional documentation is required for the administration of a PRN medication, including the time of administration with a set of initials and a progress note explaining the reason for the administration. A follow-up progress note must be written, which includes the effectiveness of the medication in the form of subjective and or objective information. On your screen is a documentation example of an administered PRN medication and the corresponding progress notes. Medication documentation must be clear and accurate. If an error is made during a transcription, the entire transcription must be marked through and retranscribed. All staff administering medication each month must sign the signature list on the med sheet as a form of identification. And on a monthly basis, HCP orders, pharmacy labels, and med sheets must be checked by two staff, ideally at the same time. Each staff must sign date and time the med sheets reviewed as documentation of an accuracy check. Accuracy checks must be completed before the start of the new month's med sheets. If an individual has PRN bowel or seizure meds, data must be readily available for cross-reference so staff can determine whether or not a PRN med must be administered. Data tracking required for medication administration must be documented on the med sheet above or below the ordered medication. If you have someone with a seizure disorder, I'll ask you to show me the documentation of their last known seizure. This section of the tool prompts me to ensure allergies are written on med sheets, HCP orders, and emergency fact sheets. The emergency fact sheet should include all prescribed medications with the dose, or a list of meds on a separate document near the emergency fact sheet is also acceptable. That's called the current med list. Section E, staff certification. Staff initialing the med sheets as administering meds must have documented proof of MAP certification on site. During a site visit, I want to see either a certification letter for each staff or a master list with their expiration date. As you know, MAP certification is good for two years. If relief staff is used for medication administration, their certification letter or a master list with their expiration date must also be on site. In addition to the MAP.gov website, Another resource for you is the DNS Diversify Technologies website. DNS is the independent testing company. Their Massachusetts homepage probably looks familiar to most of you. 
At the bottom left of the screen, you see a red area labeled Map Online Registry. If you click the Public Verification button under it, follow the prompts, and you can print out certification letters. Section F, Ancillary Practices. This section references what is called a CLIA. CLIA stands for Clinical Laboratory Improvements Amendment. A CLIA waiver allows licensed or MAP certified staff or an individual to conduct lab testing such as blood glucose monitoring or a urine dip in a program setting. There is an application process and a $200 fee. Department of Public Health issues one CLIA to a provider which covers all programs. It's good for two years and a copy should be kept in your program if it applies. To locate the CLIA application, go to the mass.gov website, type CLIA, C-L-I-A, into the search bar, and then click the first link that comes up, and you'll see this slide. If you scroll down and follow the prompts, you will come to the application. If you support an individual who receives a blood thinner such as Coumadin, you may be very familiar with the PT-INR testing process. This type of test is usually handled through an anticoagulant management service. Please note that if PT-INR self-testing is managed in your program, it may not be done by MAP certified staff. If an individual is capable of self-testing, which means performing the test, keeping control of the equipment, reporting results, receiving the dosing instructions from the HCP, and so on, it can be done by the individual. If an individual requires any support in the process, it is not self-testing. MAP certified staff may not assist. However, licensed staff may. If blood glucose testing is done in your program, there must be a corresponding HCP order with upper and lower parameters and steps for staff to take when the reading is outside of the parameter. If the blood glucose monitoring is not completed or a parameter is not followed, the HCP must be notified, instructions obtained and followed, and documentation completed. The policy manual outlines blood glucose training requirements. The training must be conducted by a licensed nurse, pharmacist, or HCP. Staff must be MAP certified to perform blood glucose testing. I will ask to see documentation of training as listed on your screen. If insulin is ordered for one of the people you support, it must be managed in one of two ways, either by licensed staff, nursing service, or the provider nurse, or the person self-administers. As with all meds, insulin requires an HCP order for administration. The insulin order must include specific parameters on when the insulin is to be held and when to notify the HCP. If managed by a nursing service, the nursing service typically has its own documentation requirements, usually consisting of a file maintained in the home. The nursing service may communicate directly with the HCP and obtain new insulin orders if needed. Anytime the nurse obtains a new insulin order, ask for a copy so you can put it in the med book. If the person is self-administering, all criteria for self-administration must be met. If the person is in process of learning to self-administer, then that means the goal for self-administration has not been met and the process of learning to self-administer must be carried out by licensed staff. As far as documenting insulin administration, you'll need to make sure the insulin order is transcribed onto the med sheet. The med sheet should clearly state insulin is administered by nursing service. Certified staff should never be initialing the med sheet next to the insulin. If at any point the insulin order changes, certified staff must DC the previous order on the med sheet and transcribe the new order, just like any other med. And this is important. The nursing service should not have a key or know the combination to unlock the med area. Access to supplies or the insulin would be through contact with the MAP certified staff. 
Auto-injectable epinephrine is referenced in this section. MAP certified staff may administer auto-injectable epinephrine with additional specialized training. An HCP, RN, pharmacist, physician's assistant, paramedic, or EMT can provide auto-injectable epinephrine training. Documentation of the training, as listed on your screen, must be maintained on site. If you have an individual with an order for auto-injectable epinephrine, you should be checking your training records to ensure each staff has the required competency evaluation tool and is currently certified in first aid, CPR, and vital signs training. Auto-injectable epinephrine training is good for one year unless there is a change in the HCP order. Retraining is required anytime the HCP order changes. Except for auto-injectable epinephrine, there is no approved specialized training program for any other injectable med. Also included in this section is GJ tubes. MAP certified staff may administer meds through these routes with additional specialized training. An HCP or RN can provide G or J tube training. Documentation of the training as listed on your screen must be maintained on site. In addition to a required competency evaluation tool, staff must be current in first aid, CPR, and vital signs. GJ tube training is good for two years as long as staff routinely administer meds via these routes. If not, the policy goes into detail regarding retraining requirements necessary before the two years. Oxygen is a Schedule 6 medication, so all MAP policies regarding medication apply. The HCP order should include parameters and what staff are to do when the reading is outside of the parameter. The HCP must be contacted if the oxygen is not administered as ordered or the parameter is not followed. Following notification, the instructions received are followed and documented. Training guidelines are located in the MAP Policy Manual. The vendor who supplies the equipment will many times provide the staff training. If someone in your program is receiving oxygen, I will ask to see supporting training documentation. Documentation of the training as listed on your screen must be maintained on site. Each person prescribed warfarin sodium must have a supporting medical diagnosis and an ordered target INR range. If an anticoagulant management service is used, dose changes must be ordered, signed and dated by the HCP. Per policy, each person prescribed warfarin sodium must have a corresponding individualized warfarin sodium protocol. Protocols must be signed and dated by the HCP, posted and verified by staff. There must be a warfarin sodium specific med sheet which includes required information as listed on your screen. The upcoming INR lab draw date must be transcribed onto the med sheet in a med block so that staff may initial the appropriate date time box when the process is completed. A second certified staff must verify the correct dose has been prepared prior to administration. If a second certified staff is not available to verify the correct dose, the dose may still be administered. To document that a second staff is not available, a circled X is used on the med sheet. Documentation of the warfarin sodium training as listed on your screen must be maintained on site. A sample warfarin sodium training has been completed and is available online. Look under Related MAP Trainer Videos and Webinars using the MAP Friendly URL. Each certified staff administering warfarin sodium must have a completed individual specific evaluation tool on site as part of the training materials. Additional requirements for warfarin sodium include a tracking system and how dose changes are documented so that changes are communicated to all staff.
Each person prescribed clozapine must have a supporting medical condition or diagnosis and instructions for staff to follow if a dose is omitted for two or more days. Per policy, each person prescribed clozapine must have a corresponding individualized clozapine therapy protocol. Protocols must be signed and dated by the HCP and posted and verified by staff. Certified staff must be trained in clozapine therapy and documentation of the training, as listed on your screen, must be maintained on site. A sample clozapine therapy training has been completed and is available online. Look under Related MAP Trainer videos and webinars using the MAP Friendly URL. Each staff administering clozapine must have a completed individual specific clozapine evaluation tool on site as part of the training materials. Epidiolex Packaging Waiver Current DDS waiver approval letter from DPH is on site in the medication storage area. There is a service provider policy slash procedure for use of the multi-dose Epidiolex oral solution. Epidiolex oral solution is labeled and stored in the original packaging received from the pharmacy. Training of Epidiolex multi-dose bottle is on site and includes, at a minimum, dated attendance list of all staff trained and complete set of training materials as referenced in the waiver approval letter. Count book documentation includes documentation of amount added slash removed from the account book including a review of baseline data for each documentation, documentation of second staff verification of baseline data and amount removed if available. Any remaining medication is disposed within 12 weeks of opening the sealed container. And before we start the next section, I'm going to turn the webinar over to my counterpart, Heather Lake. Thank you, Carolyn, and hello, everyone. I will continue with Section G, Countable Controlled Substance Packaging. All Scheduled 2 through 5 medications must be received from the pharmacy in tamper-resistant packaging. The package of medication may not have indication of tampering, such as glue, tape, or staples on the package. Scheduled 2 through 5 meds may only have one tablet packaged per blister. The tamper resistant packaging requirement includes liquid countable meds, which must be packaged so that once used, no liquid remains in the container. These are examples of tamper resistant syringes. When the cap is unscrewed, the seal is broken and cannot be replaced. If you have this type of syringe in your program, the total number of pre-filled syringes received from the pharmacy are added into the count. Each syringe is subtracted from count as one, rather than subtracting the total number of milliliters in each syringe. Many providers include blister pack monitoring as part of their medication tracking system. Although not required, it's a very effective method used to determine whether or not medications are given as prescribed. If used, staff initial, date, and time the back of the blister package each time a tablet is removed. The packages are then routinely reviewed by the supervisor and or oversight nurse to track that medications are administered as ordered. For some supervisors, it may be daily, especially when there have been issues. Many review the packages at least weekly. On your screen is an example of what blister pack monitoring documentation looks like. Only the back of the package is written on, never the front. If your program uses the Opus Cassette packaging system, there shouldn't be any spare tablets included in the cassette if the med is a Schedule 2 through 5. If the medication is a non-countable, spare tabs are allowed with additional guidelines. If the med is non-countable, there are three options to choose from for managing spare tablets if they're included in the cassette. Option one is to ask the pharmacy not to include them. Option two is prior to returning the cassette, dispose of the spare tabs following the disposal guidelines so that the cassettes are returned empty. Or option three, 
Develop an inventory system of the spare tablets returned. This could be difficult if any of the plastic tabs covering the well of the cassette containing the spares are opaque so that you can't see the tab. In the example on your screen, you're viewing a non-countable medication with spare tabs. All tabs are visible. Section H, Countable Controlled Substance Documentation. In addition to keeping documentation of all prescription meds ordered and received, countable substances require entry into a count book. I'll look at your count book to ensure it's bound with no loose pages and using the index as my guide, I'll conduct a count with you. When a count book is filled or a new count book is required for a different reason, the count balance must be transferred from the old count book to the new count book. This process requires two people, one of which is the MAP supervisor. If a highlighter is used in the program, it should only be light yellow in color and only be utilized in the index of the count book to indicate a row is completed or in general may be used as a visual aid for the HCP to indicate where to sign. If a medication is discontinued, expired or the order changes and the medication on hand may no longer be used, each program should have a designated med storage bin or area to store the medication until the disposal process can be completed. If the med is countable, it must remain on count until the disposal is completed. Prescriptions for countable medications, if at the program, must be added to the count and counted. When the prescription is brought to the pharmacy to be filled, the prescription is subtracted from the count. When the medication is received from the pharmacy, the tablets are added into the count on a new count sheet page. If a scheduled six med is considered by the Department of Public Health to have a high potential for abuse, it may be requested that it is added to the count. Currently, gabapentin and furoset should be added to the count. There are several areas within the count book where two certified or licensed staff signatures are required. The purpose of requiring these signatures is to decrease the opportunity for theft. When I review count book documentation, I look for two signatures anytime a new count sheet is started. I also look to see that the directions printed on the count sheet page match the directions printed on the pharmacy label. I look at the documentation as countable meds are subtracted when removed, such as when given, transferred, or subtracted for an LOA. Documentation should be clear and easy to read. If more than one line is needed, then staff should use as many lines as they need. The documentation should not be squeezed into a space so small that it can't be read. When the count sheet is full and the balance is transferred to a new page, I look for two signatures at the bottom of the completed page and should see the same two signatures at the top of the newly transferred page and that the amount of medication left on the full page is the same as the amount transferred to the new page. Continuation pages must be referenced correctly in the index and at the bottom of each page. When a countable medication is disposed of, two signatures are also required. The entry must explain the reason for disposal, such as refused, discontinued, or dropped. I will look for the same reason on a corresponding disposal record. The last number entered in the amount left column must indicate how many tabs are currently on hand. If the medication has been disposed and the remainder is zero, do not forget to zero out the column. If there is a medication supply discrepancy, this should clearly be explained in the count book, including who was notified. If an error is made, it must be corrected accurately. Scribbling, marking over, whiteout, for example, are not acceptable. In the example on your screen, Lisa made an error, which means only Lisa may edit her documentation to the correct information. If you discover someone else's documentation error, a progress note should be written explaining the discovery. 
then the person who made the error should write a late entry note explaining what happened. Blank spaces should never be left for a person who forgot to document to go back later and fill in the blank space. I will ask about staffing patterns. Counts should occur every time control of the med keys are passed. Usually this happens at the change of shift. However, if control of the key changes several times within a shift due to appointments, breaks, or other reasons, a count must be conducted each time the keys change hands. If a certified staff is alone or another certified staff is not available when coming onto or leaving a shift, then the staff must count the meds alone and document single person count in the space near their name on the shift count sheet. The count should be documented in real time and not rounded to the nearest hour or half hour. The next topic in this section is drug loss. All prescription med losses must be reported to the drug control program within 24 hours of discovery. This includes both countable and non-countable prescription meds. The loss of a written prescription is also considered a drug loss and must be reported. I will ask if your program has a history of drug loss. If your answer is yes, be prepared to show me doc supporting documentation that the loss was reported. This is the drug incident report form used in the event of a med loss. You can find the form using the URL at the top of the slide. DCP is an acronym for Drug Control Program. For more information on countable controlled substances and on drug loss using the MAP friendly URL, click on Training Resources and Curriculum then the DDS MAP Training Resources and you will come to this page. Click on DDS MAP Education Tools for Supervisors and you will come to this page. Here you will find completed trainings on countable controlled substances and drug loss. Section I, Transitioning to Self-Administration. If you have an individual in the process of learning to self-administer, all MAP policies apply. I will ask to see the self-medication assessment, ISP documentation, and the HCP order including how many days worth of medication the person may hold. If a pill organizer is used, it may only be packaged by a pharmacist or the individual. On the medication sheet is the acceptable code P is used and a progress note is written indicating who packaged the medication, the date, medication information as noted on your screen, and the name of the staff observing. At the end of the week, staff must document the follow-up, such as was the pill organizer returned empty or were there remaining pills? If a PRN med is packed, it must be packed separately from the scheduled meds. Documentation must include the number of doses packed and if any of the doses were used. A tracking system must be in place to follow up on the effectiveness of any PRM meds taken. I will also look for any related teaching and support plans, observation sheets, and quarterly review progress notes. Section J, Self-Administering. To be considered self-administering, an individual must demonstrate an ability to take medication independently as evidenced by storing their meds so that they are inaccessible to others, an understanding of the type of medication they are on, its purpose and for what symptoms or condition it is prescribed, knowing how often to take it, staff may verbally remind them, and to be familiar with the most common side effects, if any. Supporting documentation, as seen on your screen, must be on site. If an individual is transferring to your program and you're told the person is self-administering, it's in your best interest to temporarily consider them non-self-administering until a self-administration reassessment has been completed, ensuring that the definition is met per MAP requirements. For more information on this topic, go to the MAP-friendly URL. 
and click on Map Policy Manual. Although there are no standardized DPH forms related to self-administration, Policy Section 7 does include optional forms for your use. Section K, Leave of Absence Off-Site Administration. For any planned LOA or LOA that is greater than 72 hours, the meds must be prepared by the pharmacy. You must ask the pharmacy to split pack the meds, meaning a portion of the meds are packaged for use at the residential program and the other portion for off-site use. If the LOA is unexpected and is less than 72 hours, then staff may prepare the medication for the LOA if the pharmacy cannot. I will ask for the corresponding medication release document and look for two signatures, that of the certified or licensed staff who released the med and the certified or licensed staff who accepted it. There is no standardized DPH med release document. On a med sheet, I'll look to see if the appropriate code LOA, DP, S, P, W, or H is used. The completed LOA form should be filed with the corresponding med sheet in which LOA is documented. The completed LOA form filed with the med sheets takes the place of an additional progress note. Unused oral meds may not be returned to the program for use following the LOA. Topicals, creams, inhalers, for example, may go back and forth from the program to the LOA. If the person returned early, you could suggest the family keep any unused oral meds for the next visit. However, a system must be implemented to keep track of what the family has. If a medication is transferred from one location to another, such as between the residential program and the day program or a hospital for use, I will ask for the corresponding medication release document and look for two signatures, that of the certified or licensed staff who released the med and the certified or licensed staff who accepted it. There is no standardized DPH med release document. To locate additional information on this topic, Use the URL seen on your screen. Look for DDS Map Education Tools for Supervisors. Module 5 is Leaves of Absence and Module 6 is Medication Transfers. Section L, Medication Ordering and Receiving. I'll ask to see the system you use to track the ordering and receiving of medications. Be prepared to show me supporting documentation of how you know medication has been ordered and how you know it's been received. Pharmacy receipts must be kept on site for 90 days. Section M, Storage and Security. Each individual must have their own medication storage container and the medication storage area contains only supplies required for medication administration. Keys stay with the staff assigned med duties for the shift. The combination to access the medication keys is known only to MAP certified staff. For emergency purposes, there should be a backup set of keys and a procedure in place regarding how the keys are accessed if needed. During my visit, I will randomly review medication expiration dates. Tabs of varying strengths must be packaged separately, including whole tabs may not be packaged with half tabs. Internal meds are stored separately from external meds. This is to decrease the chance that a medication is given by the wrong route. If medications are discontinued or they expire, the medications should be removed from the individual's med storage container and placed elsewhere in the locked med area to await disposal. If the med is countable, it continues to be double locked and counted until disposed of. Meds are accessed using a key and not just a combination code. Scheduled 2 through 5 meds are double key locked. If an individual's prescription plan requires that meds be filled in excess of a 37-day supply, 
I'll expect to see supporting documentation in the MedBook. Acceptable supporting documentation can be a copy of the prescription plan requirement or a copy of the insurance card. Section N, Massachusetts Controlled Substance Registration. All programs that meet the criteria for site registration must apply for a Massachusetts Controlled Substance Registration or MCSR number. The same number is also referred to as the MAP number or the DPH number. The MCSR is kept at each site where meds are stored. The MCSR allows meds to be stored and certified staff to administer meds in a MAP program. It must be renewed yearly. Section O, Medication Disposal. When disposing of meds, look at the medication information sheet to see if there are specific disposal instructions and to flush only if the sheet provides that as an option. If not specific, staff are taught to remove the med from its original container and place in a sealable bag. Crush it and mix with liquid soap, used coffee grounds, or moist kitty litter. Reseal, then place inside another nondescript container and put it in the trash. You want to be sure you're using the most current DPH disposal form. This form must be used to document the disposal of all prescription meds, which includes countable and non-countable prescription meds such as Dilantin, Tegretol, or antibiotics. Over-the-counter meds do not require documentation of disposal. However, most agencies want to track over-the-counter med disposal this same form may be used. On the disposal form, be sure the heading is completed with the agency name, site address, and MCSR number. The item number is a chronological listing of meds disposed. Each disposal form has room to document the disposal of six different meds. The next page would start with item 7 and so on. You can categorize the disposal records year by year, starting each year with item number one slash the year. Do not skip disposal blocks and do not separate disposal forms out by individual. If the med is countable, be sure to fill in the count book number and count book page number for cross-referencing. For expired or discontinued meds, Disposal requires two MAP certified staff, one of which must be the supervisor. If a licensed nurse is participating in the disposal process, the licensed nurse must always dispose of meds with the supervisor and sign in the space labeled as staff on a disposal record. If a medication is dropped or refused and a supervisor is not available, Two MAP certified staff together may dispose of the med, if your agency allows. Some agencies prefer to have a supervisor present for all disposals. If a disposal of a prescription medication is completed with only one certified or licensed staff, then the medication must be reported to DPH as a missing medication. To locate the most current disposal form, Use the MAP friendly URL and click on MAP Policy Manual, which is where the most current DPH disposal form is located. And for more information on disposals, go to the DDS webinars to locate MAP education tools for supervisors. Disposal is Module 2. Section P Program Resources. A hard copy of either a drug reference book or printed medication information sheets must be on site and current within two years. A copy of the DPH MAP policy is required to be on site, either as a hard copy or an electronic version. As of today, the most current DPH MAP policy is dated 1115. I'll ask to see the Responsibilities in Action training curriculum and check to see that it's current. If required documents or reference materials are stored on site electronically, there are additional requirements including 
All staff must be trained on how to access the information and the training must be on site. The information must be available to staff 24-7. If the reference material is a website, it must be a reputable one. And there must be a contingency plan in the event the computer is not functioning. Section Q, Provider Policies. I will also ask to see each provider policy listed in Section Q. Provider policies are based on the corresponding DPH MAP policies, but are customized to reflect the uniqueness of your agency. They're meant to be a resource for your staff. They should be easy to understand and readily accessible. For example, an individual is going on an unplanned LOA for a weekend visit, and the pharmacy can't package the meds on short notice. Your staff should be able to quickly locate the agency policy for LOA meds and prepare them using the policy as their guide. Or, a staff is transcribing a newly prescribed HCP order for a twice daily medication and is unsure about the times to assign in the hour column on the med sheet. The answer should be in the agency medication administration time policy. If pertinent, I would expect to see policies regarding administration of OTC meds without a pharmacy or HCP label, high alert meds, oxygen and blood glucose monitoring. Section R, Medication Occurrence Reports. Medication Occurrence Reports, known as MORs, are tracked to monitor the MAP medication system. The MOR data collected statewide is used in part to improve the medication administration program through policy and curriculum revisions. A med occurrence is when one of the five rights goes wrong. While at your program, I'll check to ensure all emergency numbers are readily available near the phone and that the MAP consultants are identified are available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. When a med occurrence is discovered, staff are taught to immediately call a MAP consultant and follow their recommendation before notifying their supervisor. A hotline MOR is when medical intervention, illness, injury, or death follow a med occurrence. If you realize the med occurrence is a hotline, a DPH form must be completed and faxed to the DPH clinical reviewer and your MAP coordinator within 24 hours of discovery. This is the DPH MOR form which is required only for hotlines. If you're ever required to complete one, it can be found in the MAP policy manual or online. By clicking on the MAP policy manual, I will ask to see all original MORs. Most supervisors use a three-ring binder. Originals must be on site. All med occurrences are submitted electronically to your DDS MAP coordinator via the Home and Community Services Information System, also known as HCSIS. If the individual or the site address is not in the system, you must contact the HCSIS customer service to have the information added. The phone number is on the HCSIS homepage. In the meantime, fax the MOR to your regional MAP coordinator. As soon as the individual is added to the system, you'd enter the MOR information. Every MOR requires documented follow-up to minimize an occurrence from happening again. I'll ask to see the documentation of the provider response as entered on an MOR, which is often identified as staff training. The documentation must be kept on site. The last section of the DPH MOR our form has the MAP coordinator contact information if you have any questions or concerns about the medication system at your work location. And this concludes today's webinar.